We're going to move along to our next segment, which is about the moral and ethical issues of genomics. But I have a short video first, which introduces some of the issues. Let's go ahead and roll that tape. The scientists who launched the Human Genome Project believed in the power of genetic information to transform healthcare, to allow earlier diagnosis of diseases than ever before possible, and to fuel the creation of powerful new medicines. But it was also clear that genetic information could potentially be used in ways that are hurtful or unfair. For example, denying health insurance because of an increased risk for developing a particular disease. Aware of the danger and hoping to ward it off, the founders of the Human Genome Project created a program to explore the ethical, legal, and social implications of new genetic knowledge. The goal was to anticipate problems that might arise and to prompt solutions. For example, in the future, doctors will likely be able to give each of us a genetic report card that will spell out our risk of developing a variety of different diseases. But will we really want that information? How will it be used? Who will have access to our genetic information? How will it affect our lives, our families, and our communities? The challenge of addressing these issues is not reserved for scientists. We all have a stake in making sure that everyone will benefit from genetic research and no one is harmed. And now I'm talking to Mark Feldman. The narrator in that film said that genetic research should be done in such a way that nobody is harmed. Is that even theoretically possible? I think it's possible to uh, minimize uh, the chance that uh, negative outcomes uh, to the public or to individuals uh, can occur. Um, I don't think we've come uh, far enough along in the uh, data uh, privacy issue uh, area yet to be able to guarantee that a database of genotypes is fully 100 percent protected from, say, hacking. Um, I think that uh, the uh, narrator also uh, gave the impression that uh, your genotype at birth uh, behaved like a blueprint. Uh, and a blueprint is what an architect uh, uses to design exactly what you want him to design or her. Uh, and uh, for my, uh, in my opinion, a blueprint, blueprint is the wrong analogy to use because uh, the blueprint changes daily from conception to death and uh, one needs to keep in mind that there are interactions between the different parts of the DNA, between the DNA and the environment uh, that, are go that are going on all the time. But we're dealing with probabilities here. So if your genome indicates that maybe you have a higher chance than average of getting a certain disease, the insurance company might say, well, we don't want to take you on because you're probably going to cost us a lot of money. Um, there have been uh, congressional uh, actions that have made uh, the insurance companies not able to do that. But uh, we need to understand what risk means. And uh, the, the general public on the whole is uh, not well trained in uh, interpreting what it means to say that there is a 5% added risk to getting coronary artery disease if I carry an A here instead of a T. Uh, that's a, a process of education that uh, both geneticists, genetic counselors, and uh, good companies like uh, 23andMe uh, need to spend a lot of energy uh, uh, transmitting. Um, for most complex traits, um, we don't know enough to pr predict a lot better than say economists can predict when there's going to be a recession. But is there an expectation that as the science gets better, we will be able there, to predict? There is definitely that expectation. Um, among uh, practicing uh, human population geneticists, there are different opinions as to how strongly they believe that that's likely to be the case, even with the sequencing of the 1,000 genomes, which is uh, currently uh, going on. Uh, which is the successor to what was called the HapMap project, 
which sequence, which didn't sequence, but genotyped uh, millions and millions of the A's and T's and G's and C's in uh, 300 odd people uh, uh, from uh, three areas of the world. Um, the, the questions that come up are, are diseases the consequence of rare variation or common variation? Um, are diseases uh, susceptible to uh, other biological uh, interventions uh, at different times of the life? Um, do identical uh, genotypes produce identical phenotypes? Interesting studies recently on pairs of identical twins. And the phenotype is the outer is th appearance of the that, person? That's correct, uh, which could be a disease or it could be height, for instance. But one of the uh, studies uh, on identical twins revealed that a certain part of the way genes act in those identical twins was really rather different. And it differed more the more their lifestyles different, differed. Uh, this is a Spanish uh, uh, study that was published uh, in, in 2005. So um, blueprint it isn't, and uh, we need to keep that uh, in mind. So you're saying the genome doesn't really predict as much as some people think it does? Yes, that's, that's what I think we need to be careful of because uh, one has uh, the idea that uh, eventually p some people will be able to interfere with the genotype of their uh, offspring and uh, as produce... In, as in changing it? That's right, to produce something that they think uh, they would be uh, preferable for either them or their child uh, in, their, in the long run during that child's life. Mm. And uh, this is likely to be quite dangerous. Is that theoretically possible? I mean, is research being done now that would lead to the ability to alter the genome of a person? Um, Gavin is better qualified to answer that, but uh, I think my, my opinion is that the risks of doing that by interfering with how the rest of the genome functions in a, a complicated organism like a human are, are too great, but uh, in other organisms it yeah. might work. Yeah.